Okay, so we're we're live now. We're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our adaptive reuse, reuse webinar. I'm Jason Wong, and welcome. Before we introduce our panels, I want to recognize our sponsors. You can see them on your on your slide. A big thank you to our sponsors, and also a big thank you to Tiffany Miner who's been a big help in setting up this webinar. Our two highlight sponsors today are Beach Fleshman and Remax Commercial. A quick video will follow now. As accountants and advisors, Beach Fleshman goes beyond the routine. We bring a variety of perspectives to the table by working with a wide range of industries and people. From planning to implementation, and long after a project is completed. Our agility and expertise empower entrepreneurs like you, giving you the ability to elevate your business. You may need short-term solutions that offer a bit of or long-term personal partnerships that make a big difference in day-to-day -day operations. No matter your needs, we make it easy for you to achieve your dreams and help your customers do the same. Our team works closely with you to give you confidence and make a positive impact. Because at the end of the day, we're not just working within our community, we're a part of it. Beach Fleischman, collaborate forward. what Remax is. Brand awareness and, and power within an industry, you can't do any better than Remax. People are attracted to the brand and they're comfortable with the brand. Honesty and integrity is just woven into the core fabric of what they do. Remax Commercial is consistently ranked as one of the top 20 commercial brokerage networks in the world. We're in the top 10 when it comes to the total number of listings in the marketplace and the same with square footage. We have commercial representation in over 500 offices and divisions. When you work with a REMAX commercial practitioner, they're a partner and they have representation all over the world. One of the most valuable assets is REMAXcommercial.com. It's all about trying to find the inventory. So one of the things that REMAX commercial has done really well is provided the commercial consumer the ability to search more commercial listings across the country. Really globally, having the strength of REMAXcommercial.com behind us, it's a big deal. When you think of the REMAX Commercial Global Network, it's made up of an amazing group of people. We make some pretty important promises to our clients. These people have always taken care of me. They've always done the right thing. We don't take anyone's business for granted. My REMAX practitioner, he says what he's going to do, and he does it. But when you sit across the table from a REMAX Commercial practitioner, you're sitting with someone who has the full authority to manage your account. They are the decision maker on every step of the deal. Remax Commercial has an opportunity to serve such a broad base of consumers. Retail, industrial, land, development, office. And they also find people that have worked in every price range. You know, we go up against the major companies with victories in multi-million dollar trophy office buildings in major cities around the world. We're selling properties at anywhere from $500,000 to $5 million. Last year, we did over $11 billion in commercial real estate around the world. It doesn't matter if it's a $150,000 property, that property is important to that person and we treat it the same. So every piece of business that comes into our firm is very, very important. To me, real estate's a relationship business. And if that's the way you operate, then Remax is where you want to go. You know, the Remax name, it'll get you to the door. Once you go in the door, the people you're going to meet there and the people you're going to work with are going to impress you. You'll meet people that have worked all over the world, at major corporations that handle disposition, you know, buying, selling, leasing, whatever it might be. And that's so important to the clients because of the experience of the individual practitioners and the quality of what they get just working with REMAX. They have a strong ethic, and that is to take care of your clients and do right by them. I know clients are faced with extremely difficult decisions. You know, they can be 100% comfortable calling a REMAX commercial practitioner, talking about their unique scenario, and knowing that they have a global partner on their team that can handle any aspect of commercial needs. 
you can make that call and work with one of the best commercial practitioners in the world. I would like to introduce our, our panelists for today. We have Marcel Dabdub, he's CEO of CID Holdings, and he will be presenting Central Block and Brings Mortuary. We have Rick Volk of the Volk Company. He will be presenting to Oracle Place. And we have George Larson, co-founder of Larson Baker, who will be presenting the gallery at Skyline and Campbell. Our format is each presenter will provide a brief description of their project, followed by a question and answer uh, discussion. So if there's any questions, just click on the, qu the Zoom question box and we'll gather your questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. We'll start with Marcel, followed by Rick and George. Marcel, you're up. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Um, I'm going to pull up my uh, PowerPoint. So I just hit share screen, I believe. Um, Correct. Share. So, and I go into the slideshow. Sorry, it's supposed to be at the very start of it. Okay, so I'm gonna be presenting on two projects that were adaptive reuse projects, specifically uh, historic adaptive reuse. Um, one of them is Central Block. Um, Central Block is the south side of Congress between Sixth Avenue and Scott. So it basically starts at the uh, Chicago store on the east side and runs all the way to uh, Wigwam on the west side. Um, We've, we've acquired all those buildings except for the MEB building, which is right in the middle, which we have under contract. And um, we, we've basically been um, renovating those buildings based on specific uses. These are just some historic pictures um, of what that block looked like. This, this was you know, the Chicago store corner, which still looks very similar except for a lot of the um, the signage. Um, I'm trying to figure out. This is an older picture. I'd have to check in with Ron, but uh, but it's the same section of the block. And then um, there you have music store, which is called Fisher's at the, at the time. But that's that's still the same sign that was then moved over to the corner. Um, basically, what we're doing with that building is we ended up combining the top two, the top floor of the Chicago store and the Gus Taylor building, which is right next to it. And we're doing, uh, we have a, a co-working tenant in that space that has ended up um, really negotiating more leases where you have a company that's looking for space and you lease that space to them at a, at, at a, at a higher fee than what they would normally pay if they were in a, in a um, longer term lease somewhere else. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of what we did. There was there were some large blue lamp beams you could see there um, that that were that were supported. And because we wanted to raise the overall clearance throughout the building, we ended up replacing those support structure with uh, metal beams. Um, and then and that gives you sort of a better idea of, of what it's you know, what it started to look like once we replaced those glue lamb beams. Um, some pictures, again, showing the, um, that second floor watch under development. The reason we ended up doing both, um, both floors as one space is because it, was, it made sense to just put in one elevator because technically it was a change of use for the second floor of the Gus Taylor. It just made it easier for us to figure out the ingress and egress as, as a single project for the entire second floor. Um, here are some additional pictures of, you know, we, we ended up opening some of the, um, we ended up opening some of the light wells. There's four, there were originally 
what light was in the building. And uh, you could see a little bit of one of those light walls right here. I don't know if we have additional pictures. Here are just some pictures of the of the exterior. And then we go to the other side of the block, which is where Wigrama was. And that's, you know, a picture where you where you saw how it started out as a, as a pharmacy. I, I, I don't have, I couldn't find pictures of what this part of the block looked like because it was mostly covered up with, um, with different types of material and panels. And we were very fortunate to find out once, you know, we did this before we bought it, but once we started removing those, we, we, saw, we, we found out that a lot of the original historic brick was already there, which is, which is great. Then we just had to sort of go in and, and replace a lot of the, the, the window space. This is the grill room after it was um, rebuilt after the fire. Um, and one thing that we did in these spaces, this is, this is 1055, which was our first tenant on the west side of the block. Um, one thing we started to do in these, we did in these spaces is we installed these helical columns because we wanted to, because we, we at that time, the whole building was vacant. All, all of the spaces were vacant. So we wanted to put some, some columns without really having all the details on, on what we would be doing on the upper floors. And um, but we, we, we knew that we wanted to give ourselves that possibility. You see some of those columns right here. And obviously, the only time to do this work is when the, the spaces are vacant. Um, I think the one thing I would have done differently here is I would have done more due diligence on, on the design for those structural columns just because we it, it turned out that what we ended up doing don't really support a lot. Whereas initially, we would have wanted to go to, you know, two or maybe even three floors. The, we ended up with a design that is probably going to end up supporting just the deck. <laughs> So we're still trying to figure that out. There's options for reinforcing um, it, but as, as of now, we are looking at a partial structure on the upper floors that would be supported by these, uh, these columns that, that we put throughout the space. Um, the next project, uh, like Jason mentioned, is, is Brings Mortuary. This was a, a mortuary that, that was built in, in I, think, I think it was the, the before 1920, and um, you know, one 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 benefit is that my one of my partners, Patricia, Ron's wife, she's very creative with uh, um, hospitality spaces. So we had this chapel in the mortuary that uh, that it's just hard. You know, you could have used it as an office, but it had a lot more potential. And she turned it into a really cool bar. Those pews that you see on the right, those were original pews, which we then gave to the diocese, which the diocese didn't need. And I think we ended up getting some of them back and just turn, in, to, turn them into seats. And this is, you know, the second floor deck. The second floor is mostly office space, but we wanted to take advantage of this, this great deck that they had there that, you know, has a great view of the skyline and, um, and you know, the park around, uh, uh, around the Children's Museum and, and even Armory Park. This is, this is kind of where we are right now in terms of having rehab that space for office use. Um, and, and that's, you know, those are the pictures I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll do the question and answering after all the presentations. Okay. Uh, Rick, you're up. Oracle 2. Two Oracle, please. Rick, we can't hear you. And that's basically my story. 
Anyway, thanks, Jason. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Cool projects. I enjoyed seeing the part about your strengthening package because that's part of our project at Two Oracle as well. And our project is, of course, completely different from yours, um, but those are very cool projects. <clears throat> so my story starts, as so many do, with I had an exchange. So I built this Starbucks, planning to own it forever. I kind of overbuilt it. I made it over 3,000 feet, expandable, 30 feet high, 16 foot ceilings, put in sprinkler lines and gas, even though Starbucks didn't need them and had room for expansion in case he ever moved out. Thought I'd own it forever. Kind of panicked when I started getting these steady rent payments and I didn't know what to do, so I sold it. Um, after so selling it, I visited George and Melissa and said, hey, I've sold this, need some help, have anything I can exchange into. And uh, they said, yeah, we've got kind of what could be a complicated project. Um, we've got this great location at Oracle Nina, the Platinum Fitness Building. And uh, do you want to be partners on it? <clears throat> and I thought, you know, I've done some partnerships with them in the past, uh, very successfully. They were relatively simple deals, although those was kind of complicated. And I thought this would be great. I could be like have a partnership and then like the Chinese, I could steal their intellectual property and learn how they do it. I mean, after all, this is the group that bought River Center for $10 million and over 13 years of intense management got it to be worth about $7 million. And then after a year, sold it for $24 million. So I said, I wanna see how this secret sauce works, which is generally George's letters is how everything works as most of you probably know. Uh, so the question was how to turn this, uh, next slide please, into this. Um, so that's what we were able to do. I was able to take that Starbucks and turn it into something like this after a year and a half so far of hard work. Um, the project really was, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, this is what the project looked like when we bought it. It's 55,000 square feet. And when we put it in escrow, it had a 30,000 square foot tenant platinum fitness that had an acrimonious relationship with the landlord. Um, our plan was to, uh, uh, be the Knights in White Armor, work out a deal to save the, the Platinum Fitness, Fitness operation for at least a few years, put us some cash flow, and with that cash flow, gradually remodeled the project and retenant it. Um, of course, George would write one of his letters, the tenant would fall in love, would be able to work with them the way the previous landlord had. So right when we were about to tell, the property manager was about to tell the tenant that Excuse me, uh, Rick, you need to please readjust your camera. Okay. So right when the property manager finally told the tenant that um, they were selling the property, that previous weekend, the tenant had given up the ghost, signed an agreement with LA Fitness to sell his entire list and closed up shop. Um, and so we're in escrow. No longer do we have our major tenant. Um, 30,000 square feet vacant three stories, empty swimming pools, um, a couple of uh, jacuzzis filled with stagnant water, uh, holes between the floors where the uh, uh, racquetball courts used to be. Um, and so we went from about 85% occupancy down to about 30% occupancy. So taking that into account, we moved forward to close anyway. So we immediately uh, met with the town of Oro Valley um, and uh, because we knew we had to get Oro Valley approval for a renovation. There's four corners on an Oracle, obviously. There's one corner in Oro Valley, that's our corner. So we had to go to Oro Valley, with, um, which was actually, they've been very responsive. And we wanted to talk about our architectural styles. The plan at that point was to emulate maybe the design of the Larson Baker project with Snooze and Postinos, take that modern design, focus on restaurants, focus on patios, and get some of the same uses and hopefully some of the same rents. So we went to Oro Valley, met with them, and they said, you can do any architectural style you want as long as it looks just like Casa Vidovas. And so we walk out of that meeting and uh, <clears throat> Melissa says, uh, well, they want restaurants, they want new active tenants. They're, not, they're gonna need modern architecture. Um, I want modern architecture. And that's probably when I realized, <clears throat> I should have realized this a long time ago, but when Melissa says she wants something, She's gonna get it. So we hired the same architects who did Casadobis. And um, uh, we said, okay, do something modern, um, but make it tie into Casadobis so we satisfy the town of Oro Valley. Uh, so can we go through the uh, next slide, please? Um, so the intersection, Ina and Oracle, obviously a fantastic intersection. Next. 
the building's got a great location, high visibility. Um, you can see it from the intersection. It's close to Oracle Road. It's, um, it, you know, it really was a prime location, although it's a tired structure. Next, please. Um, you can see it's got mountain views. In this case, we got views of the Catalinas, the Tortolitas, and the Tucson Mountains, all from that building. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, next. So there are really five components to this building. We have a, a, a wing of shops. We have a second floor filled with office tenants. We have a basement, and then we have the main floor. So we had to figure out what to do with the area previously occupied by Platinum Fitness. And that included the basement the first, and the first floor, basically. So since we knew nobody wanted to be in a basement, we called it the garden level. Immediately after that, George brought in um, Chris Phillips and Brian Schuyler of Lux Space Suites, and they agreed to take 10,000 square feet if we put in a few windows. They recognized that the space had high ceilings, really interesting industrial design, and that with windows, we could make it a whole different operation. So they were the first people to step up, and they've been great to work with. They're very happy tenants, um, and probably something to do with the massive amount of TIs that we're giving them. Um, Nancy brought in Charlotte Studios, and um, that's another 6,000 square feet. So right away, our garden level was filled up. We just had to do some improvements to um, move it along. Next level, please. Um, this is the second floor. So there's 15,000 square feet of office space. Most of the space was already leased when we got it, and most of the space is still currently leased. We've actually experienced a great deal of demand for the last spaces that we have because our exterior renovation is underway and people are recognizing what it would be. So the toughest area, the, the garden level, is now taken care of. Second floor was always taken care of. Um, we knew from the beginning there'd be a huge demand for restaurants because with our collective 100 years of commercial real estate experience with all the restaurant deals Bolt Company and Larson Baker have done, we had a finger on the pulse. We knew it would at least the restaurant space up very first thing. Uh, next level, please. So this is our ground floor. As you can see, the south wing, which is bell toned to the end cap space, 8,000 square feet of retail, was already leased. We lost a tenant. We think we're going to replace them very shortly. We've had several, we have a lot of interest in that space. And then we have this restaurant space that we designed that keep in mind was going to be the first to lease. And we had the West space. And the West space was going to be kind of the back space with not much frontage. We started getting interest from office tenants. And um, at that point, this part of that Commerce Bank space was open to the basement level. We started talking to Commerce Bank, got serious about them, and they realized they could use the front portion of the space for their retail operation and the back portion of their space for um, their offices, their main corporate offices. So working hand in hand with them, we designed an 8,000 square foot space, put a wall of windows in the north side, that was briefly a blank wall, and it put windows along the west as well, so we look out over Tonachua Park and look out to the uh, Tucson Mountains. And once again, Commerce Bank has been a phenomenal partner. They've, they've worked with this every step of the way. Um, I can't say enough good things about those folks. So in this process, we thought we'll just fill in this area um, to reclaim the uh, racquetball courts. We found out that when you build restaurant space, you're supposed to have 200 pounds per square inch. When you build office space, you're supposed to have 100 pounds per square inch. What do we have? 50 pounds per square inch. So we had to do a, a basement strengthening package in order to put anything on the first floor. So our first floor plan, just our pro form took a big jump up when we got Commerce Bank, reclaimed 3,000 square feet, great tenant, everything's awesome. So for about a month, we had beaten our pro forma. After that, we got the $350,000 bill for our strengthening package and we blown the pro forma. So that was a happy month there. Everything has changed. Um, so we're currently at 84% occupancy. Uh, um, next slide, please. Um, and this is what it's going to look like when it's all done and when the restaurant space is in. You can see the patios. You can see how cool the building looks. You can see how evocative it is of Casas Adobes. Um, and uh, once again, I have to say something about Oro Valley. Oh, Oro Valley had wanted something more like Casas Adobes. When we brought into their design review team, and there's mayor and council, a different design that said, we want to do something more modern. We want to bring in restaurants. We want to get the type of tenants you want. They completely support us throughout the process. And regardless of some of the stuff that's happened there to make 
and development difficult in the past, I have to tell you, every level of staff of the mayor and council has been completely responsive to our program. Um, so now, even though we thought it released to restaurants first, we don't have any restaurant deals right now. Um, obviously, sit down restaurants are struggling. Um, and so that we decided that's going to have to be put off in the future. Our plan of getting this all done in 15, 18 months, doing a takeout loan changed. Commerce to the rescue again. We took out a uh, interim loan with them, knowing that we would finish this project and then would take as long as necessary to get the type of tenants we wanted in the last 8,800 square feet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is what the north wall used to look like. Next. This is what it looks like today. Next. Uh, that's, that's old again. Next. Uh, next. And this is what it now looks like for, or will look like in two months for Lux Space Suites. Obviously a dramatic change between that wall stucco and this, the upper windows or where Commerce Bank is. Next. Uh, we had to say goodbye to the swimming pool. I think it was hard on all of us, but that's now gone. Next. These cross braces were throughout the building. And luckily with Lux Space at this level and the upper level, now Commerce Bank, they utilized these cross braces as architectural features. So it became, even though it was a design issue, they worked it into their design, it became a very cool uh, aspect. Next. So as Melissa said, when we were first going to this to a high level, design to high level, she said, if we get to high level, tenants will step Lux Space Suites does a phenomenal build out. 36 individual salons, producers, trainers, hair cutters, um, a barbershop, first class operation. You can see some of the X braces in there. This is what they designed, and they'll be open probably by the end of December, early January. Next. Ooh, cool. All right, next. Uh, and this is what Commerce's Bank is doing. We created a new entryway for them so that retail, they have a wide row of steps walking from the retail for their operation. And on the interior, they did a uh, modular glass system throughout the space that really brings in the windows. And they've got, like I said, they got views of three different mountain ranges from that location. Next. Oops, back to me, sorry. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, we are in about two months. The project should be generally completed for the exterior renovation. Commerce and Lux Space and Pure Lit should be fully open. We had 84% occupancy. We still have 8,800 square feet of potentially restaurant space available. We have about 7,000 square feet of patios goes with that restaurant. So while we don't have a drive-through, we can offer amazing patio locations. And even though our program for restaurants, we are willing to talk to other tenants as well. Our current plan is to have it all completed by the end of the year. And this is an in and open and uh, look forward to getting some really hot restaurants the next week. Thank you, Rick. George, we save you for the best, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right. I know what you're thinking. George has finally lost it. True phones are so 1960s. And I don't know who that dude is in the picture. But if you'll stay with me a few minutes, we'll get around to introducing you to Maxwell Smart and the Maxwell Smart way of development of the gallery row office buildings. So let's go through a few slides and uh, see if we can learn anything about how Maxwell Smart would address adaptive reuse. Next slide, please. You all do know this intersection. It's the corner of Skyline and Campbell. Northeast corner, Lan Cantata is on the Northwest. Just north of us is Vivace Restaurant. There was a retail center there called Gallery Row. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like. It was a retail center and it had as its anchor a large format restaurant. But this property fell on hard times. Two recessions, two restaurants, two galleries closed 
and the property was in trouble. Next slide, please. Here was the problem. It had dated architecture, sort of interesting, but it wasn't working for retail. It had sort of limited parking. If the restaurant was gonna be as successful as Vivace, the rest of the shopping center wasn't going to work. It was 70% vacant and the lender took it back. So inner Melissa Lau, president of our company, and she looks at the same property and she sees an opportunity. Next slide, please. It was the opportunity she saw. It's a great intersection for offices. It wasn't designed correctly for retail. Uh, 22,000 square feet originally on CB1 zoning, built in 2000. The original tenants were long gone. Lender had had it since 2017. Uh, it had traded hands at 7 million five. Uh, we put in a bid at 3 million six and we're lucky enough to get it. So now Melissa has to convert the opportunity into the real world. So she goes to the next slide, please. She goes to her strategy, which is to convert the property from retail to office, to get rid of the uh, retail ish look and try to get a more modern, more contemporary design and set up everything to be office. we're going to enclose the atrium. Uh, we hired a great architecture and construction firm. They do both things. Uh, uh, Rep plus McLean is both a contractor and an architect. So uh, we had a complete package with them. Uh, we went to Foothills Bank and they said, we'll sponsor your redevelopment of the property. And of course we were the, we were the developer. So here's how it evolved as Rep plus McLean plus Melissa started to put together the concept Next slide, please. Here's reimagining the property, getting rid of the Santa Fe look and going to contemporary. Next slide, please. Another picture of how Rep plus McLean were going to reimagine this property. Next slide, please. This is the rendering. Uh, you'll see a better picture later. This is a little bit uh, distorted. But you can see we added glass. We've got some second floor offices where they weren't there before. And so this was our plan for the gallery row. And of course we had to develop a pro forma for that. So let's look at our original pro forma. Next slide, please. I don't know if that's, it's a little bit probably hard for you to read, sort of hard for me to read, but if you could make your screen bigger. Uh, we had 22,400 square feet. And our estimate was about $24 a square foot would be the net rent. Of course, take a vacancy factor off. About 500,000, 505 in this pro forma would be our net operating income. Well, if we apply a cap rate to that, multiple tenants, uh, we figured someplace between six and a half and seven uh, would be where the property would, uh, would be valued by an appraiser. So, Using the middle number, it was about $7,500,000. So as you recall, our acquisition cost was $3,600,000, about $163 a square foot. Uh, we're gonna put about $102 a square foot in that redevelopment to the outside design, paying the uh, tenant improvements and paying the soft costs of it. So you can see the total there, and then you can see our goal, our aspiration was to make about a million six. But as those of you who know my old partner, Don Baker, who said once he would rather sell his left kidney than one of our properties, we like to hold our properties long-term. So we had to make a presentation to our investors and say, let's look what it looks like over a six year time period. Many of you old timers, next slide please. will remember the three T-bars that, uh, that we use. The T-bar on the left where the property is, that would be the property without financing, wouldn't it? You can see uh, the 505 minus some, uh, some uh, factored in uh, vacancy would be the numbers that you see there. The middle row is what the lender would expect or what we would use with our financing. In this case, a year and a half ago, financing for construction would be oh, closer to 5% than it would be where it is today. And our cash flow T-bar is on the right. We asked our partners to put up about 2,250,000. 2 
and you can see the cash flow that we'd have after debt service for a six year hypothetical holding period and an IRR of 22% per year. We were pretty satisfied with that. But then that darn Maxwell Smart comes in. Next slide, please. And we learned some things that uh, we didn't know. We get lucky enough that uh, we find Fidelity Investments, big company, wanted 8,000 square feet on the second floor. Well, we didn't have 8,000 square feet and enough room to put Iridius Holdings, who also wanted to be on the second floor. That meant we would have to create a floor where the Steinway piano had soaring two-story ceilings. We filled that in. What it gave us was an absolutely gorgeous view of uh, the city of Tucson from Iridius's conference room. The architects, Rep Plus McLean, had some killer designs, but none of those designs are inexpensive. Uh, we had some Chi Chi tenants and they said, we need covered parking, that adds to our budget. And we needed to add 5,000 square feet of building area to the property. As Maxwell Smart would say, next slide. Missed it by that much. All right, what do we do folks? We are going to have to revise our pro forma. Next slide, please. What do you do when you bust your budget? Well, just go do another pro forma. Here's what we had learned in the year that we were working on the previous pro forma. The corner is pretty strong. We'd had some experience with it, with the MDA building that we restructured for SunQuest information system. We knew that NAI Horizon had had a success by moving Merrill Lynch to the Five Palms restaurant. We know there's a limited supply of high quality office. We knew we had a great looking design and we had tenants willing to pay a premium to be able to go into that design. So we decided to change our budget and change our design. Let's look at the next slide. This is what the property looks like today. Fidelity has moved in, Iridius Capital, Foothills Bank, uh, Stewart Title, uh, what's the, um, Coa, not Coa Banker, um, what's the, I can't think of the retail uh, retail residential office that's there, but we're 100% full. Next slide, please. This is what the front looks like. That's a, uh, a balcony with glass overlooking it. On the left, you see Iridius Capital. On the right would be where Fidelity is. Next slide, please. There is a picture of the building. There's a, also another side to it, of course, off to the side, which is single story retail that's got Stewart title and some other people in there at dentist's office. Next slide, please. So what did we learn? We had two perspectives on this. I had my perspective, which uh, came from Napoleon, uh, where he said, I'd rather my generals be uh, lucky than able. And we had Melissa's perspective on change, where her dream was not going to be deferred by a busted budget. So where'd we end up? Let's go to the next slide and see how we did. Here's the revised pro forma. We now have 27,400 square feet, but we have higher rent. We got about an average of $28.25 a square foot in net rent from our six or eight tenants that are there. Uh, taking a vacancy factor, we had $235,000 of additional net income. We also found with Fidelity and Foothills Bank, we could attract a little bit lower cap rate. That means a higher price. So our actual appraisal came in. You can see that in September of this year at a 6.25 cap rate. And so next slide, the number that sounded pretty good to us was right down there. Uh, we are making more money now by our errors of judgment than we were before. Uh, may I? refer you back to Napoleon's generals. But of course we keep a property for five years. So let's go look at the five year projection or six year projection for this property. Next slide, please. Here we see it uh, as it came out. We now have our permanent loan in place. Thank you, Ted Herman. Uh, we had a $7 million loan, it's non-recourse. It's just under 60% loan to value. And we were able to get a 3.85% a uh, fixed, in, fixed interest loan, 15 year fixed, 25 year amortization, 
Uh, and so our three T-bars work out where the uh, left T-bar is showing the net income that comes in now that we have our higher priced tenants in place. Uh, we were able to save some money on our permanent financing. And if you look at the third column, we were able to refund to our investors about half of the initial investment they put up. And as of today, moving forward, we'd be looking at a property that would have about a 48% per year internal rate of return. So you ask, what's this got to do with a sitcom from the 1960s? Well, like Maxwell Smart, uh, all of our sitcoms start out with great intentions, a lot of bumbling in between, but at the end, at the end of that half hour segment, by golly, the, uh, the comedian is still out there. We're still doing business. It might be a whack-a-mole version of development, but by golly, when you do adaptive reuse, uh, you have to be ready to pivot. Thanks very much, Jason. Thank you very much, George. We'll now go into our, our group uh, panel discussion. Rick and Marcel, be sure to take yourself off of mute. Marcel, many of your projects are located downtown. What's so special about downtown? And do you think the COVID issue will drive downtown flight? So um, our, our bet on downtown is a long-term bet. And, um, and that's why you, you end up taking, I guess you end up taking, we end up taking more risks just because these are, these are complex buildings. And I, I, I should have gone more into detail on some of the numbers. I, didn't, I, I thought it was 10 minutes with Q&A, but um, to, to give you some perspective, we, we, we ended up buying these properties. The Chicago store, we ended up buying at about $85 a square foot. If you include the, um, you know, if you include the basement space, which, which has tall ceilings, and you end up being, you know, still under 100 if you don't. Um, the Gus Taylor building we bought for about um, uh, $125 a square foot. Um, then, then the rest of the central block we bought at around $100 a square foot. Uh, you don't, when you're buying them, you don't know what your renovation costs are going to be. So that's why I mean by being a long, longer term play. Um, the brings we we ended up buying for, I think it was. 70s, but then we ended up selling a, a, a small narrow parking lot on the back for the Baloo Law Project, those three-story um, townhouse units on stone. So I think that brought our, our basis down to between 50 and $60 a square foot. Um, again, without really knowing how much it's going to cost you, because you have to find out who your tenant is going to be. After after we bought the Chicago store, we started conversations with uh, CBS, and and that would have been a very profitable deal, even despite the amount of money you had to put in to the space to accommodate CBS. And I think that number was around, you know, two million dollars for a nine thousand square foot, you know, floor area. But um, but. With regards to you know COVID and and you know why I feel good about downtown, I feel really good about downtown because we're we're social creatures in the end. I think a lot of development in the western part of the United States was based largely around the use of the automobile. You know the the streets were designed in a way to bring you know be able to bring as many cars from point A to point B, and you ended up with a an experience that was solely reliant on the vehicle and i i my bet my, my long-term bet is that that people are are as, so, as, be, as social creatures are going to be drawn towards experiences where they can actually you know walk to places am i concerned about covid i'm not concerned long term i i choose to believe that there's going to be a uh, a vaccine for that and but at the end of the day it's a bet so uh, who knows? But uh, but yeah, I still feel very very strongly, mostly mostly because because of that one human trait that that we all have. You know, people like 
there's a segment of the population that likes to be very private and a segment of the population that likes to bump into people. They like to see, you know, have a more walkable experience. And, and that's really my strong feeling. Thank you very much, Marcel. Rick, to Orc, a place was a major renovation. Swimming pools you had to remove, walls you, have to, you had to remove, reinforcement. How much were your cost overruns? <laughs> and were they in budget that you thought they would be? Uh, no, we blew our budget uh, pretty soon starting off. Um, I think originally we planned this whole project to cost around seven and a half million. Buy it for three million seven hundred thousand. Um, with a seller carry back of about two million dollars. We were going to just finance, just self fund the rest of it until we got it fully occupied or close to fully occupied and get a takeout loan. Um, given the timing challenges with COVID and everything, that's why we went to a, an interim loan. Um, or currently, um, that initial budget did not include the commerce space being completely filled in, filled in and used. When we brought that up to a class A level, um, we increased our potential income um, to approximately $900,000 a year for NOI. Um, that was coupled with the strengthening package I mentioned, which blew our budget right away. And since then, the Fiberon that we're putting on, now Fiberon is a, uh, they're like they're like slats that you use to build your deck. And they're made to go on the ground and they're really heavy. But we're putting them on walls and underside of ceilings because it looks cool. Well, when you do that much weight, which in this case is 40 tons of Fiberon, 80,000 pounds on a building built in the mid, mid 1970s, you find out that maybe they didn't use the same structure. So we've run into strengthening packages on the exterior as well. Instead of just pasting this on the outside of the stucco, we've had to remove the stucco, put in new framing, and put the and put the fiber on and the metal cladding on. So with all those overruns, we're probably six, seven hundred thousand dollars over budget. Again, we picked up some NOI, just like George's other example with with the tenant. So um, we're going to probably end up about eight or nine thousand dollars over budget. Um, and but we're going to be at a relatively comfortable level for the next year or two with just the leases we have in place. And then when we get the restaurants done or occupants in that space, then we'll be right back to the number we performed. Thank you, Rick. We have a question from Nancy McClure. George, I'm going to let you uh, speak first on it. Her question is, what are the panelists thoughts on how to redevelop retail big boxes since retailers of that size are likely not going to be active anytime soon. Tear down and start with something new or take the box and do something creative. George, you're up. We look at those a lot. And uh, in the past, we've been successful about taking big boxes and dividing them up. But as Nancy mentions, there's less and less of junior anchor tenants. Yes. Uh, uh, um, Ross and Michaels are still out there doing deals, but we find uh, there's fewer of the junior anchors doing it. Tuesday morning's gone. We know that we know the group that are that are gone. I think they have to be turned into warehouses or schools. We've had some pretty good luck putting in uh, schools in some of our big boxes. Uh, Brookline College is in one, and uh, we've got some others. So I'm seeing that. I don't think you have to tear them down. I don't think they convert easily to small retail. I have not done medical office buildings out of big boxes, uh, but we have had luck with uh, with schools. And I think um, sooner or later, we're gonna see uh, warehouses go to a scale of 40 to 60,000 square feet uh, and feed those from bigger warehouses. And that might be a, a use for the property. The problem is the rents are always gonna be lower for those alternative uses than from the good old days when we had lots of junior anchors. Thank you, George. Marcel, nationally there's been talk about global warming. There's been regional talk about water shortages. Have you ever thought about using green building techniques for your next projects? Um, we, we, we are building to higher green standards on 75 Broadway. Um, the, to be honest, the primary reason is that we have to. We're using structured financing to fund that project. We have zero tenants. 
Um, they, so we, we don't have a single lease. And, and part of the reason is, you know, it's partly multifamily and it's partly office, but in either of those cases for a building that's two years out, you, you're not going to have a, you know, it's, it's really difficult to get tenants. We had one when we were in partnership with Jim Dunn, but we, you know, there were some complications there. Our partner fell out and the delay just put that one tenant, which was prepared to take 60,000 square foot, uh, 60,000 square feet, which was two of our floors. It just took the timeline too far out. But, but so, so we had to find a financing structure that would accommodate a mixed use building that was 0% free lease. So we, we went the structured financing route. And for that, we are securing a loan that's pretty much like a CPACE loan. And I don't know how people are familiar with CPACE financing, but CPACE is a program, it, 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 it's a PACE program with a C in the front of it because it's for commercial projects. But it's a program whereby a, you know, the, the state enacts legislation and that legislation allows developers to impose a, you know, a voluntary assessment on their project so that the assessment can be used to um, to obtain financing. That's not your typical mortgage financing. It's something, it, it, it really gets paid back through an assessment. You know, the benefit for that is that you don't, you don't have debt on the property for purposes of setting up a, you know, structured financing, but you really do have debt on the property because at the end of the day, your monthly, you know, your, your, your quarterly payment on, in this case, it's, you know, quarterly assessments, however you pay it, ends up being a lot higher because you're trying to service a $25 million loan over 30 years. So, but the one requirement for that is that you have to, um, you have to build certain lead standards. The only reason CPACE allows people to impose these, assess these voluntary assessments is if you build to certain green standards. And that's why we're doing it, because that structure allows us to obtain structured financing for the development of this project. Um, and I think that it'll continue to... One of the problems was that CPACE legislation is approved in 36 states and Arizona is not one of them. So we have to find a workaround and that's a lot of time. But to your to your question specifically on, on do we expect do I expect to see more green building? I do primarily because I think there's going to be more of these programs that are going to offer certain incentives to um, to you know build certain minimum green standards. Thank you, Marcel. George, Marcel, and Rick, you can all each be considered a master of the universe for developing in Tucson. What's so special about Tucson? We'll start with you, Rick. What's so special about Tucson? Uh, well, I'd say, um, first of all, this was in Oro Valley, but it involved a lot of Tucson people. And Tucson is relationships. So in this project, you know, I've done stuff with George forever. Melissa, so we had a Larson Baker Volk relationship. Then we bring on people like Michael Seaver for the architecture. They've been around forever. They've done multiple projects. I own a project they built in, 19, in the 1980s. Um, then you talk about George's relationship with Chris Phillips, which helps bring the Lux Space Suites. Um, Buzz's relationship with Commerce Bank, our relationship with him. Everybody knew that this team would come together and deliver it. So Tucson special because it's a small town. It's a million people, but it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. And if you're trustworthy, the word gets out. If you're not trustworthy, the word gets out. So when we had a couple bumps on this project, um, when COVID hit, we knew our pro forma had to change. We'd had commitments to Chris Phillips. We had commitments to Commerce Bank. We had commitments to um, Linda Clenard of PureLit. And we knew we had to move forward with the project, even though we were somewhat concerned. Um, and that's all about the relationships to Tucson. So that's really what makes Tucson special. George, what makes Tucson so special? I do some thinking about it and Phoenix, and the difference is Tucson has such gorgeous landscaping, such gorgeous uh, desert, high desert lands, landscape, that when you 
try to scrape and build as the level that Phoenix did, you get a lot of resistance and maybe it's been for the good. Certainly Phoenix has grown faster than Tucson, but Tucson has developed, I think, more attractive, more on a human scale. And uh, we, have, we have been able to uh, differentiate ourselves, I think. Now we're not as strong financially. We don't have the same gross output as Phoenix does, but we do have a uh, cohesive small town that is very attractive and I think uh, is poised for a great long-term run. I'll take the small town atmosphere and our, our friends in the real estate business helping each other. Marcel, with your international business connections, you could be developing anywhere in the world. Why Tucson? Marcel, are you on mute? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, I like Tucson for the reasons that uh, that uh, Rick and, and George mentioned, which which combined to me sort of um, speak to the character of the place. There's 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 a sense of place in Tucson. I uh, I don't I don't find a sense of place in 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 markets that develop so you know too quickly or too horizontally um it's just you know part of a sort of a bigger mass and i think tucson because of its topography because of its size its small town feel it has a character where people i think feel that there's a strong sense of place um i i, I went to a trip to to meet up with some friends from college and you know, every year it's somebody else's turn to pick the location, and one of them picked Nashville. And my first reaction was, "Why Nashville? You know, why Tennessee?" I just thought it was it was a bad choice, but you know, I went because we had this tradition for for you know almost 30 years. And and I got there, and I just I I just fell in love with the place because it's for the same reason. It just you know there's there's these features about it that that really create a sense of identity for the place. And I think Tucson has that. And it has a lot of features of a great university. You know, um, we just need to bring in more employers to uh, support the economic growth component. But I just think it has a really strong sense of place. Well, thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Marcel. That concludes our, our panel discussion today. You know, we have upcoming events. We have events coming up on November 17th for our construction webinar. We have a candidate breakfast on November 12th, and we have an upcoming virtual global conference on November, November 5, 6, 9th, and 10th. So look for those announcements in our forthcoming emails. I would like to, again, thank our panelists and of course, thank our sponsors. Without our sponsors, we would not be able to put on these webinars. So George, Marcel, Rick, thank you very much for your participation. And of course, thank you very much to all our sponsors. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Beam me off, Andy.